Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest series of vodcasts. And this is going to be a detailed analysis of small bowel obstruction. I'm not sure if this is a three-parter or a four-parter, but I've gone into great detail about small bowel obstructions and complications, including ischemia, and I hope you like it. So without further ado, let's get started. When you think about small bowel obstruction, it's something that we all see on a daily basis, whether it's to rule out small bowel obstruction, to evaluate the extent of small bowel obstruction. And at the end of the day, what you're really trying to decide, is this patient going to be managed conservatively or more aggressively? Is this patient going to be discharged or is this patient going to be admitted to the hospital? The concern of small bowel obstruction, of course, is the potential for intestinal ischemia. CT is the study of choice for looking at the small bowel because we can look at the bowel, we can look at the mesentery, we can look at the mesenteric vessels, we can look for thrombus or stenosis, we can look at obstruction and if there is obstruction, what's the cause, where is the obstruction, is it an adhesive band, is it a hernia, is it a tumor, is it an inflammatory disease, and once we figure out specifically what we're dealing with, CT is very helpful in making decisions. It's a very easy study to do. It's typically a dual phase acquisition. You'll do some multiplanar and 3D imaging for better detail. But again, it's a very, very important study and small bowel obstruction is one of the most common clinical presentations in the ER setting. So again, very, very important and it's something we need to look at very carefully. As we said, the main complication is ischemia. One of the key things, of course, with CT is the early detection of ischemia. When you pick up a patient with extensive pneumatosis or portal venous air, that's the end result of ischemia. It's infarction, and those patients have high morbidity and high mortality. So the goal, of course, is to pick up ischemia or potential ischemia early when you could do something about it. Now, the most important criteria in looking at small bowel obstruction is looking for dilatation of the small bowel loops. We look for thickened bowel loops, we look for air fluid levels, we look for transition points. One of the most common advantages of coronal over axial imaging, it's much easier for me to follow a transition or look for a transition. With axial images, you're kind of going up and down. With a coronal view, you really can follow the loops for a distance and look for those transitions. Now, I will say when you read articles or listen to lectures, people always make the point about transitions, which are critical, but you can't always be certain where the transition is, and surely you can't always be certain as to the cause of transition. One common thing which you assume is there's a band present or adhesion, but it's difficult to see. The accuracy of picking the specific point of obstruction in different articles ranges between 63 and 93%. I don't think it's as low as 63, but it's surely not 100%, and probably 85, 90% is sort of where you're going to be at when we look at things very carefully. In terms of protocols, we like to give water. Now, the truth is, if the patient does have obstructed bowel, the bowel is distended with fluid, and so that fluid really is good enough, but we use water. We typically don't use positive contrast material unless you are looking for a site of leak, which is a little bit different scenario. One of the things you want to be careful, of course, is that patients have slow transit time, and so water is not going to be a problem. You don't want to make a situation where the patient gets positive contrast, it creates lots of artifacts, and since the bowel transit is very slow, giving the oral contrast really doesn't help you any. And you know that from small bowel series. We also give IV contrast. IV contrast is critical to be able to look at the mesenteric vessels, both on the arterial and venous side, as well as bowel enhancement or lack of enhancement. Typically, 100 to 120 of Omni 350 is good. And again, that depends on the patient's size. An injection rate around 5 cc's is truly ideal. Fast injection is very critical for good opacification. Now, in terms of bowel ischemia or obstruction, 
You can get by with a lot of cases just simply doing a venous phase at about 70 to 80 seconds. But if you really want to get a good look at the mesenteric vessels, then you need dual phase imaging, doing arterial at about 30 to 35 seconds, and venous at about 70 to 80 seconds. I don't find any role for non-contrast CT, so we don't do it. And I have not found any great advantage, and I don't think I've seen anything in the literature where getting delayed phase imaging really is helpful as well. So uh, we don't do that either. In terms of scanning, I like thin section CT. Uh, 0.75 millimeter thick sections every 0.5s allows you to get really good multiplanar and allows you to get really good 3D imaging when you need it. So thin sections is always going to be critical. In terms of data analysis, axials and multiplanar are the two most critical. MPR is particularly sagittal for looking at the origin of the mesenteric vessels, coronal for looking at transition points. Curved planar doesn't help me very much. Volume rendering is very good helping with transition points. And there's been some work with cinematic, which can be valuable. And MIP is always going to be valuable to look at the mesenteric vessels. If you're looking for vessel cutoff, for example, it indeed can be very valuable. Now, I'll just show you a couple examples of looking at small bowel. This was a patient with suspected small bowel obstruction. This is a patient with Crohn's disease. There's mildly dilated small bowel. There's prominence of the mesenteric fat, fiber fatty proliferation commonly shown in patients with Crohn's. And then when you look at the coronal, you can see this really thickened loop of small bowel, which is where the transition was. You can see how when you go backwards, there's thickened bowel, but when you look at the coronal, it's much easier to see the location of the transition and the extent of the areas of narrowing. Eventually, this patient underwent surgery. The patient also had several areas. Here's another area of stenosis. Here's another area, and that's very common in Crohn's patients. When you go from the coronals to the MIP, you very nicely see the prominent vasorecta. And again, the ability to look at the vessels, MIP is really good, thin section MIP, about 20 millimeters in section, you can scroll through, gives you a very good look at vessel patency, but also the vas erecta, which you can see very nicely in this case. Here's another patient with Crohn's, just to emphasize the thickened distal small bowel and a really nice look at the comb sign, which is the branching of the uh, iliocolic vessels. When patients have inflammatory changes, whether it's Crohn's or ischemia, or many different causes, the um, vas erecta will be very prominent, the vessels get engorged, and again, the use of water as a contrast agent really helps us in looking at bowel. You can see the prominent enhancement of the uh, mucosa and the changes in the submucosa, and again, a very, very nice look at the patient's inflamed bowel, fiber fatty proliferation, and the extent of the narrowing. And this, of course, would be a patient who eventually will go to surgery and have this bowel resected. Here it is a little bit closer on the MIP imaging. Again, you can see very nicely the details. And here it is with cinematic rendering, showing you the, uh, the bowel, the dilated, thick and small bowel. Remember with... Um, Cinematic rendering, fluid and bowel tends to look red. You see some of the prominent vas erecta. We can look carefully for transition points, and that works very nicely. Another example looking at bowel. We talk about a target sign, which you can see very nicely here. Now, people talk about a target sign for ischemia. You can see a target sign with Crohn's disease, a target sign with inflammatory bowel disease of other etiologies, including infectious etiologies. You can see it with graft versus host. So a target sign is a very good finding that there's abnormality in the bowel. And yes, it could be ischemia, but it could simply be inflammatory disease as well. But it's something to look for. And again, the extent of bowel involvement, particularly when you're looking at transition points, when you're looking at extent of disease, Here's a patient where in the coronal you can see very extensive disease, but when you go to the MIP, the prominent vas erecta showing you the involvement, and then in volume rendering, which shows you both the inflamed bowel as well as the prominence of the mesenteric vessels. So again, something very, very important and works out very nicely in clinical practice. Now, when you look at small bowel obstruction and look a bit more at the details,
morbidity and mortality, it accounts for up to 16% of hospital admissions for acute abdominal pain in the ER. And again, most patients are treated successfully with NG tube decompression. The key thing, of course, is separating who can be managed conservatively versus who needs surgery. So for example, the mortality of bowel obstruction ranges from 2 to 8%, but may increase as high as 25% of bowel ischemia is present and there's a delay in surgery. Remember, they always mention in surgery, the sun does not set on bowel obstruction. CT has been shown to be the best single imaging tool for evaluating suspected small bowel obstructions, sensitivity and specificity in the 95% range. And this article from a few years ago by Paulson and Thompson is really an article that's very much worth your time to read. Now, if you look at bowel obstruction, there are many causes. Typically, people divide them into extrinsic and intrinsic and intraluminal. So extrinsic would typically be adhesions or hernias, endometriosis or tumors, but those first two are the most common, intrinsic inflammatory disease, neoplasms, uh, vascular causes, hematoma, radiation, intussusception, and then intraluminal are kind of unusual things ranging from gallstone ileus to foreign bodies. Now, when you ask the question and you say, what's the most common causes of small bowel obstruction? Then I'm going to list four things, adhesions, IBD, small bowel tumors, and hernias. And when you get down to the numbers, adhesions is by far number one. We used to think that with laparoscopic surgery, there'd be less issue with adhesions. But the truth is there's the same or more issues with multiple trocars. So unfortunately, laparoscopic surgery, which is wonderful, does not eliminate adhesions and then external hernias and neoplasm. If you were looking back at 100 years ago, the most common cause of small bowel obstruction was external hernias. So things have really changed over time. Now, when you're evaluating a patient with small bowel obstruction, perhaps one thing good to think about is what questions do you need to answer for the referring physician? Well, there's really two big questions. Does the patient have a small bowel obstruction or are there other findings that explain the patient's symptoms? And if the patient does have a small bowel obstruction, is it a partial obstruction or complete small bowel obstruction? Again, the question, discharge versus admission when you're speaking about the ER setting. If the patient has a small bowel obstruction, can we determine its cause? Is it Crohn's disease? Is it a tumor? Is it an abscess? Is it a stricture? Or is it a ischemic bowel or the potential for ischemic bowel? And again, is this a medical or a surgical problem? People often divide obstruction into simple and complicated, with simple typically is intermittent or partial obstruction, and complicated tends to be closed loop strangulation. When you talk about complicated, you're talking about a patient who's going to go to surgery. Remember, if surgery is delayed more than 24 hours, mortality is up to 25%, while early intervention, it's as low as 1%, but with an untreated strangulation, it's 100%. So again, patient survival depends on you making an early diagnosis. This article by Surijala in Emergency Radiology a few months ago, time to surgery is the most important prognostic factor as mortality significantly increases with the duration of symptoms. Ritz et al. determined that survival rate in the first 12 hours was 84% compared with only 11.6% after 24 hours and 2% after 48 hours. So you can see why it's so important to be thinking about acute small bowel ischemia when you look at patients with suspected acute abdomen. Now, if you ask the question, what findings are we looking at? Well, we look at the bowel itself. Wall thickening over three millimeters is concerning abnormal enhancement, other areas of decreased or increased enhancement. Remember with ischemia early on, it could be increased enhancement and later on it's decreased enhancement. Is the bowel in an abnormal position? Is there a hernia present? Is there malrotation? And what about the mesenteric fat? The mesenteric fat is a good sign. I showed you a few minutes ago some Crohn's disease with fiber fatty proliferation, the mesentery. But with ischemic bowel, you can see engorgement of the mesentery. So it can be a very, very important sign to look for.
Now we also look at the size of the small bowel loops. People typically say over 2.5 cm, the bowel is dilated. We look at something called the feces sign, which are air bubbles and intestinal content proximal to the site of obstruction. It's a wonderful sign. It doesn't happen probably more than 25 to 30 percent of cases, but it can be very helpful. We look at wall thickening as we mentioned, and of course transition. Where is the change? Transition can help you detect a hernia, an adhesion, or a tumor. In this article by Scaglione, in high grade or in chronic obstruction, endoluminal stasis or gas create an appearance rather similar to feces in colon, the small bowel feces sign, but again, only in about up to one third of cases is this present. This feature is usually evident, proximal to the transition point, and helps localize it. Again, it's a very important sign. And let me give you an example. Here's a patient with dilated small bowel. You can see the loop, and then you have lots of fluid in this loop, but look at the next loop. That's the feces sign. It looks like feces in the small bowel. And you can see right here, there's a transition point. This was a band in a patient who had a prior appendicitis 25 years earlier. The transition point is well seen. There it is on the coronal again and on the 3D, very nicely demonstrating the patient's transition point. And again, you can not see the band here, but you know exactly where the transition is. The surgeon can go in with a right-sided approach and knows exactly what's going on. And this was a wire or a piano wire uh, sized adhesion, but critically located causing the obstruction. And this patient fortunately did fine. There was no need for bowel resection because intervention was done earlier enough. So again, a very nice example of the feces sign and a very nice example of showing you a transition point. Now, one of the things we'll talk about, and I just mentioned, is an adhesive bands. But let's stop at this point. We've had about, you know, a good, a good lesson to getting started on small bowel obstructions. Let's stop here, get a cup of coffee, and come back. And I'll see you in a few minutes. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.